right, my friends. Put your phones away if you would. And we'll get started. Welcome to the big show. Uh, for those of you who are in uh, ninth grade, you may recall that uh, one of the things we do in junior high chapel is celebrate birthdays. We don't do it in high school because there are a lot of them. Um, but we do celebrate some. So, I can give you a hint as to who I'm talking about. Where is, where is he? Is he actually on the phone? <laughs> Doesn't he know anything? You don't call on a phone, you text on a phone. <laughs> All right, let's sing. Ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday. guys thank you so much you all have birthdays and we all celebrate from time to time but guess what I'm only 36 yeah. I think your last two birthdays have fallen on a high school high school chapel day so which is good all right let's keep moving lots of announcements here we go. Uh, all right, we need your help for this. A bunch of uh, Christmas trees, JSB fundraiser, and so on. What we need is your help on Saturday. This could be a, a volunteer opportunity for you. Uh, it's gonna take place at Mac and at Three Points. The jobs are organized in two hour time slots and there are a variety of, of jobs. Um, Mrs. Levitt is actually going to be in chapel here at 2.40 when we dismiss. If this is something that you're interested in, uh, you can talk to her right afterwards. She'll get your information, get you set up, uh, and you can pick which campus works better for you. Uh, and we need the parking lot, the lower parking lot, totally clear by Friday night. If you're hanging out in a school parking lot on a Friday night, you should probably deal with that anyway, but just don't, don't be here, okay? Um, <laughs> just just be, be gone. Um, I want to give a shout out to the wrestling team, or at least part of the wrestling team, for their help in loading trees. This one was actually last night uh, after a full practice. They're unloading trees up on the field. So wrestlers, thank you for your work there. <laughs> Nicely done for that. Uh, if you're interested in the LAN party, you need to see Liam or Chance. Do you have a quick, super fast update? Yes. All right. There you go. So, is it on? Okay. It is. All right. So there's some um, new information. So if you want to guarantee your spot in Land Prairie, there's no like spots, but the sign up closes at 3:30 because you need to send uh, permission slips to the emails that you provided. So you may want to check that list to see which email you put on. Uh, it'll be a lot easier, or else you'll have to bring your parents to school so they can sign something and leave because we're playing some games. That is that 3:30 today? today? Today. Yeah. So a little short notice, but by 3:30 today. Try and make sure you get your name on the list. You don't have to, just to make it a little easier for us. Sweet. So we, you know, everything else is the same, so hope to see you there. There's right. a lot of people coming. Excellent. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. My good friend Sarah Catlett with a Senate announcement. It is on. Oh, okay. So, um, as probably most of you remember, uh, the last week before Christmas break is homecoming week. And yeah, and because of that, we are going to be having homecoming on Friday. And leading up to that, we will be having a pep assembly. And we are going to be having homecoming posters. So, because of that, they're going to be... That was yes. nice. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate good. it. Yeah, so, um, so they're going to be uh, grade meetings next week um 
the rooms of that will be announced, I believe, hopefully tomorrow. I emailed the teachers, I know that one of them got back to me. But the full list will be announced tomorrow and go there, it'll be Tuesday. So go there during lunch and talk about what you guys want to do for your poster and then make it week of homecoming. That's it. There you go. Thank you, Sarah. All right, Mr. Larry Dean Anderson, whose Green Bay Packers play this evening, so if he's sorrow for tomorrow, tomorrow. All right, there you go. Okay, boss. Speaking of homecoming, um, there is a dance coming up um, a week from Saturday. Soon, yeah. Yeah, and we can... Uh, all right. Okay. And... Um, if, if I'm bringing a guest from outside of Bellevue Christian, there's a dance form that Mrs. Wilkin has that needs to be filled out. Some of us have been a little lax at doing that. We'll try to expedite things as much as possible. But please, uh, outside guests, if you brought a guest previously, the same guest, we have those forms on file. You don't need to jump through these hoops again. We can just make a copy of the previous form and allow you to get your tickets and Senate members know they can not sell you a ticket until that form is completed. Number two, um, got an email, speaking of clear parking lots, Bellevue Press allows um, Bellevue Square employees to park at, uh, at their church parking lot. So if you're a junior or sophomore who's parking down at Bell Press, starting tomorrow, there are gonna be a whole bunch of cars down there until our last day of school before Christmas. So park anywhere that you find an open spot except try to stay away from close to the church building because they still have people coming and going. So tomorrow you will show up and you may say, someone's in my parking place, absolutely right, and it's gonna be that way for two weeks and one more day. Thank you. You got it, thank you. <laughs> okay, so another thing that happens the week of homecoming week, which some of you may remember is market day. And this year it's gonna be on December 15th and 16th. I don't know which one's junior high and which one's high school. Both, both. And so this year we have cake pops, uh, coffee, and like peppermint hot chocolate, there's like brownies, there's gonna be breakfast food, and then dumplings. So some of your favorites, it's gonna be really good. And all of the proceeds uh, generated by Market Day are going to Esperanza, which funds, which is like a microfinance charity in the Dominican Republic. And they help uh, women, single women mostly, Businesses started in the Dominican Republic to help their families and everything. So it's a great charity. So the more money you spend, the more money they can spend on their business and help support their families. So yeah, and the food's gonna be really good. So. And bring cash. We're not. We're not. Yeah, no plastic. credit cards or anything. Bring bring that cash. Some cabbage. All right. All right. Thank you. All righty. Uh, thank you for that. Our guest today comes all the way from the athletic office where, uh, I know, that's, that's a courtyard and the gym. So uh, he's just one of, uh, one of the good guys in this place. So please welcome Mr. Mark DeYoung. So there you go. Thanks, man. All right, um, I am going to share a number of stories today with you that are a small picture of my story. And you all have stories as well. And this is just kind of a, an opportunity, hopefully that, because um, I don't always get the chance to be in front of all of you. So this is an opportunity for you to get to know a little bit, me a little bit better. And whatnot. So, first story I want to tell you is um, about a young man that I got to know pretty well back in Michigan. That's where I'm from. So, this young man was someone that went to Christian schools his all his whole life. He grew up in a Christian home. He loved uh, sports. Uh, he loved uh, choir. He loved um, competing. 
he loved um, just being a part of, of, uh, of school and whatnot. However, that competition piece for this young man in particular was something that got him in a little bit of trouble. Let me explain. So when this young man got into high school, he started to play soccer. And when he started to play soccer, he was, he was decent. And when he started to play, he realized that, um, that the coach wasn't the, the strongest coach from keeping him in line. And so he had the opportunity to start lipping off, not only to the coach, but to officials and some of his teammates. Well, that led to his freshman year, the first time um, he decided he didn't like something that happened during a game, and he went up to the official and told him in a way that uh, wasn't really appropriate. And for those of you that know soccer, the official will go to his pocket and pull out a card, and it was a yellow card, which is a warning, so you got to go off the field, okay? And over the course of this young man's high school career, he got quite a few of those. This person also played basketball. And when that person realized that he could get away with some of those things in soccer, he tended to do those same things in the basketball court. And when things wouldn't go his way, and when things wouldn't go the way, that if the team wasn't winning, or if he thought there was a foul or whatnot, he'd tell the official again. Well, obviously basketball, technical fouls. It got to the point where this young man's mom, in the morning when he would leave school, or would get ready to go to school, this young man would go up to his mom, and his mom would say, son, I love you, have a great day, please don't get any yellow cards or technical fouls. It also got to the point where he got pulled to the principal's office. And the principal said, if you get any more, you're not going to be able to compete anymore. Because that's not what we're about. That's not what you're about. So if I had to ask you just to yourself right now, how would, how would you label that person? How would you, you don't know them, but you have in your mind who that, what somebody like that would be. You have in your mind maybe what that person would, would be like. You have in your mind what they, um, you, you have some preconceived notions about them. So you might be running, running through some of those uh, with your head, some characteristics of them. So that person was me. And I'm not very proud to say that. And as a side note, you probably are going, okay, that's kind of interesting. This guy's the athletic director and he did all that stuff that he probably says that you can't do. That's exactly right. Um, and uh, I'm going to get to get to this a little bit, a little bit more. But if I had to characterize that, I would characterize it in this way. Selfish. Self-centered. A punk. A jerk. And those are probably nice ways to put some, some of them. All right. Um, but those would definitely be, be, be some things that, that would, um, would characterize me when I was in high school. And again, I'm not proud of that, but it's part of my story. Here's, during that time, like I said, I grew up in a Christian home, I went to a Christian school, I would characterize myself as a Christian, but yet everything about all of that little bit that I mentioned was about me. It was all about what I wanted to do, I didn't really care about so much anybody else, any of those things. If you asked me at that point in time in my life, I would tell you my favorite verse was probably Jeremiah 11. I bet you some of you can just go through that in your mind right off the bat, right? In Jeremiah 29, 11 goes, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. And I just kind of focused on that prosper part. And I happened to be talking to somebody about that, and they said, you know, Mark, what's your favorite verse? And I said that. And they said, did you keep reading in that verse a little bit further? And I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, did you read the couple verses after it? And I said, no. 
He said, I like I just Jeremiah 29, 11. He said, well, keep reading. He said, okay. Verse 12, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. And then verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And basically, that person challenged me and they said, okay, you want the prosper part. You want to do all that stuff on your own. You want to do some of those different things. But are you doing what it says in verse 13? I didn't really want to answer that question at that point in time. Um, how many of you have ever had a come to Jesus moment? A couple of you are raising your hand. Okay. Here's my come to Jesus moment. I had, I had fantastic parents. I was very blessed. Both very involved. Both a part of supporting and watching and, and being a part of, of myself and my siblings. I can vividly remember sitting in the kitchen after, a, I don't remember if I was a sophomore or junior, and I was wallowing in self-pity from a loss the night before, and it was everybody else's fault. And so basically what I did was, is I was talking to my dad, and I was, he was asking about some of the things with the game, and I said, well, the officials sucked, the, my teammates couldn't make a basket, um, the coach didn't know what he was doing, um, and I just started going down the laundry list. And, my, and I will never forget this, because this is the only time in my life that my dad has ever done this to me. He looked at me, he grabbed me by the arm, and he said, what are you talking about? And I looked at him and I, and I said, what are you talking about? And I started going down the line again. And he goes, you should listen to yourself talk. He goes, it is sad. He goes, you point at the officials, you point at the, your teammates, you point at everybody else except for you. I go, what do you mean? He goes, it's you. You're the one that's being a jerk. You're the one that's being a bad teammate. You're the one that's teach, treating your coach like crap. And I can remember I started to bawl because my dad had never ripped me like that before. He literally ripped me a new one and walked out. And I was sitting there on the kitchen table crying my eyes out because I had never had someone that was willing to do that to me before. And I don't think that was easy for my dad to do. I truly believe that God puts people in your life at certain times for certain things at certain moments. That's not an accident. At that point in time right there, it was my dad. If I were to say the names Harold Molinar, Carol DeVelder, John Houseward, Randy Beist, those names don't mean anything to you because you don't know who those people are. But those people to me are people that are very special because God put those people in my life to, to, to teach me things at certain times that I needed it because they directed me and they brought me back to where I needed to be. And I think that that's, that, that's something that, that's pretty, um, that's something that's pretty biblical. If you go back in the Old Testament, there was all the prophets, right? That they, 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 they brought the, um, the Israelites or they brought different people back to where they needed to be. They brought, their, they brought their focus back. You look at the New Testament and you can look at the disciples. You can look at, um, you can look at Peter. You can look at Paul. And obviously you can look at, at the life of Jesus and, and how he directed the life, the lives that, he, that they worked with back to where they, to where they, where they needed to be. We all have stories, and those stories are better, and they play out much better when they have other people involved. How sad is the story if it's only about one person? One of the people that I mentioned in, um, 
in my in those names that I mentioned was was a guy by the name of John Houseford. I want to quickly tell you about Mr. Houseford. Mr. Houseford was my psychology teacher in high school. He was also my track and field coach. Senior year of high school, about three quarters or uh, halfway through the track and field season, um, we were at a, a big track meet, and and how everybody called him House. House was behind the bleachers throwing up. And everybody's kind of going, "What's going on? Something doesn't seem right." He was a really athletic guy, about six foot four, was really skinny, and he just kept losing weight and was really skinny. Finally, um, about, I don't know, three, four weeks before school ended, he announced that he had pancreatic cancer. And he was really close to my sister and I in particular because we had him in, in certain events, and my sister was a couple years behind us. And I can remember when he first got diagnosed, he went to the hospital. And we went to the hospital, my dad, my sister and I, and it was really the first person in my life where I knew someone was going to die that was, that was close to me. I hadn't had that before. And we went to the hospital and we went in and the first thing, he, he is a big, I mean he's got more tubes and everything going in and out of him. And the first thing he, he asks, he gives, us, he gives us, tells us to come over, he gives us a big hug asks my sister how the long jump is going, he asks me how the 400 is going, starts just asking all these questions, right? How, how, are, how are you? How are you doing? How that's going? How are they doing? And, he, and just kept going, that's who he was. And what I recognized in, in him in that was that it was, he could have been sitting there and been ticked off because he knew he was going to die. But yet, he cared enough about me. I'm like, what does that matter how I did? What was my time in the 400? That doesn't matter. What does it matter what my sister long jumped? He came to chapel. Came to chapel, the last chapel that we had. We had chapel every day. Every day. Think about that, Mr. Olson. <laughs> we had chapel every day. He came to the last chapel in the wheelchair and, and sat in the back. And everybody came out and they and they they gave him a hug and I'll never forget that it was something that was that was a real special special time and again everything about that was him giving of himself for others for me that was a, a, a flag that said mark that's what you want to be like that is Christ with skin on that's what, one of the reasons why I wanted to be a teacher that's one of the reasons I wanted to go into education was because of, because of Mr. Houser. Okay, and that's some, something that is there. He was totally selfless, and he was, and he was, totally, um, was totally that way. My last story I want to tell you. My wife Kristen and I um, had the privilege of doing youth group in Arizona uh, the first four or five years that, well, actually we did it about six or seven years, excuse me. And um, we had the opportunity to take groups of kids to some youth conventions. And so we went to different places to do these youth conventions. And um, there was a guy by the name of Mike Iaconelli that told this story. And it's, it's one of my favorite stories. Um, and it goes something like this. There was a famous piano player that came to New York City and was going to give a concert. It was around this time of year, Christmas time. It was sold out within minutes of, of going on sale. And a mom who really wanted her son to play the piano bought two tickets, thinking that if she, if she bought this ticket, brought her son to this concert, this concert hall, that that would inspire her son to want to become a great piano player. So they go to the, they get all dressed up, get all fancy, buy them a, a little bow tie and, and put them on, on a, a little sport coat. And they go and they sit in the, in the, in the crowd. And there's not too many kids there, right? More, mainly adults. Ready, ready to hear Jan Paderewski. They go, they sit, they're sitting kind of in the back and the little kid does what little kids do. 
starts getting up. I got to go to the bathroom. I got to get out of here. He's got wants to move around. They're there early to make sure that they got their seats, but mom is just starting to get frustrated because the little kids going back and forth. You've seen it in church or, or in some of the different places, something like that, right? So the mom starts talking with the person next to her, and what she doesn't realize is that the little boy goes out down the aisle and starts making his way to the front. And all he sees up front is, is the piano. And he makes his way all the way up, all the way up to the piano. And he sits there. And he doesn't do anything at first because all he sees is the bright lights. And all of a sudden, he just starts playing chopsticks. So he's playing chopsticks, and all of the people that are sitting there are going, what is going on here? That's not what I signed up for. This is a kid. This isn't Jan Paderewski. Jan Paderewski is a lot better than that. Okay? And he keeps playing. The little kid keeps playing. Keeps playing. And all of a sudden, you see Jan Paderewski. Here's the commotion. And he comes out and he goes, what's going on? And he sees the little kid playing the piano. And he kind of steps out. And everybody kind of comes to a hush. Granted, there's still a lot of people that are ticked off, right? He steps over. Everybody's waiting to see what's happening. Comes over behind the little boy that's playing the piano. And he starts playing this beautiful concerto with chopsticks. Now, if I was Jan Paderewski, I would be playing that concerto. That's not in my gift set. All right? He keeps playing, and he keeps playing, and he keeps playing this beautiful concerto with chopsticks from this little boy. And everybody that was ticked, everybody that was frustrated, everybody that was upset, just sat in awe as to what was going on. Ladies, guys, our lives, my life, is like that chopstick song. Okay? It sometimes sounds good. Sometimes it's simple. Sometimes it goes off key. Sometimes it's messed up. Okay? And Jan Paderewski, the great conductor, okay, that is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when he comes around us in our messed up stories, in our messed up chopstick stuff, He's the one that orchestrates this beautiful concerto that can only happen if it's in tune with him. Because by itself, it doesn't hold any, it doesn't hold any weight. It doesn't hold any weight at all. So you might be saying, so what? I'll try to wrap this up and bring it together. So what? Number one, seek out God with all your heart. When you do that, you can't do it half. You can't do it quarter. Seek him out. Two, seek out people in your life that will speak the truth. Seek out, whether that be a friend, whether that be an adult, whether that be a teacher, whether that be a youth group leader, whatever it is, find those people that speak truth. Sometimes the truth hurts a little bit, but find and seek out those people that speak truth to your life. Surround yourself with friends that love, care, and encourage for who you are, that aren't willing to be afraid to hold you accountable. Be that kind of person to other people as well. And finally, I would challenge you 
If you have somebody that you can identify like that in your life, tell them. Go up to them. We just had Thanksgiving. We've got Christmas coming. Go up to them and say, thank you. Thank you for being a person in my life that speaks truth. Thank you for being a person in my life that cares. Thank you for showing me who Jesus is in how you act and how you treat me. My favorite verse, and I want to end with this and I'll pray, is Philippians 3, uh, 12 through 14. Not that I have already attained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of which Christ Jesus, excuse me, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards a goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. Don't blend on the past. Focus on the future. Pray with me, would you please? Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for putting people in our lives that love us and care for us. Thank you for sending your son as the greatest example. Lord, help us to um, play that chopstick song and know that we're going to mess up and know that we're going to fall short and know that it's not going to be perfect. But also let us know that you will be there right alongside of us. And we thank you because we do know that because you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for each and every one of us. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Thanks yeah. for letting me share a little bit. All right. All right. Thanks, Mark. We're going we're gonna to end our time today with uh, Amanda and Caroline playing a song. Some of you may know uh, from Switchfoot called Dare You to Move. And there's a line, there's a, there's a section in here that I really like. And I'm going to offer it to you kind of as a challenge of, of uh, what, what do we do from here? What do we do with what Mr. DeYoung just said? And the line is this. Is the tension is here. The tension is here between who you are and who you could be. Between how it is and how it should be. The easiest thing to do is just stay where you are. And we're going into a Christmas time that tends to be pretty self-focused. So it's just a constant effort to try to push yourself out. So as Caroline and Amanda lead you in this song, a, a cool acoustic version of this song, be looking at the words, but be thinking about what do you do with what Mr. DeYoung just said. Take it away, girls. Welcome to the planet Welcome to
two things. Uh, when we put chairs back on the metal racks, remember just lowest rung, so kind of get them as low as possible. Mrs. Levitt, are you in the house? There you are. If you're interested in Christmas tree helping, please see her. And here's an option. You can either go back to homerooms as normal for some post-chapel reflections, but the band is also going to play for the next 15 minutes. So if you want to stay for some musical worship, by all means do that. Uh, they're going to start playing. They'll come on up right now and get going. So chairs, homerooms.